Well, last time you remember, we were looking at a number of different things. The phenomenon of eclecticism, the Egyptian revival, various uh, phases of the Gothic revival, and especially the new phenomenon of the picturesque as um, exemplified in this house on the right, Alexander Jackson Davis's Lyndhurst uh, in um, north of New York City of the 19, uh, 1830s. And then we saw the adaptation of this concept, this picturesque concept, for much more modest domestic architecture, especially by Andrew Jackson Downing in his book on cottages, as he called them, uh, in the 1840s, and then uh, his book, Architecture of Country Houses of 1850, illustrating simple houses for ordinary Americans. And we see here in uh, the um, example on the left that we looked at, um, I think I maybe did not point out, has those, that pattern of board and batten walls, uh, uh, vertical boards uh, with battens over the uh, over the cracks that was this very um, almost barn-like kind of construction that uh, introduced the, this a rustic element. Also the uh, picturesque integration of nature into the architecture and other uh, factors that we uh, looked at. And uh, one of the other uh, houses we looked at from Downing's work, a somewhat larger uh, house, but um, still picturesque even though it doesn't have all of the picturesque characteristics. Remember, one of the main picturesque qualities or traits was asymmetry. And if you look at this house, it's not, strictly speaking, asymmetrical, but it's irregular. Uh, and it has these other characteristics, nature incorporated into it, and um, multiple gables and things. So it's clearly picturesque in spirit. It shows that the picturesque does not depend on, on having a certain number of specific characteristics. It's more spirit. and. Um, Downing gave uh, lots of practical information on how to build and live in these houses. And he talked about his ideals of American uh, life. We saw simple, unostentatious, and, uh, and honest Republican virtues, as he put it. Um, uh, an underlying philosophy that surely was uh, a part of the, uh, that contributed to the popularity of his designs, which were built all over the country. And I'll show a couple of examples in a uh, minute of picturesque cottages that were actually built. But first, I wanted to uh, mention another publication, somewhat similar to Downing's books, though a, a decade or so later, written by Catherine Beecher and Harriet Beecher Stowe in um, 1869, entitled The American, Women's, uh, American Woman's Home, a selection from which is in the readings for this week. A book in which um, house plans were presented and discussed in a similarly uh, practical way, as in Downing's um, books, but with an emphasis, a slightly different emphasis, more of an emphasis on such things as um, ventilation and heating of the house and how women's work in the, in the home could be made uh, easier. This reflected Another uh, important American trait of this period, I think, which was a spirit of invention and uh, innovative ideas about improving life, of which we'll be seeing some other uh, examples uh, later today. Today is another one of these lectures where a lot of things are being included, a lot of different uh, aspects of mid-19th century American architecture. It's a period of, of, of all sorts of um, ferment and ideas, new ideas, and things happening all at once, some of them contradictory. It's a fascinating period. But as far as Beecher's book, read um, this uh, uh, selection uh, uh, signed for this week and see her uh, uh, specific proposals. They're interesting ideas she had. Also her underlying philosophy. Like, um, like Downing, she, um, uh, I, uh, she presents a philosophy. It's not just strictly about architecture, but it's a rather different philosophy from Downing's. Also in the, um, the overall physical form of her proposed houses, and here on the, on the left, in the slide on the, on the left, uh, you see one of the plates from her books that shows clearly that she's drawing on this uh, picturesque cottage tradition of, of Davis and uh, Downing. You can just compare the two, uh, uh, two images here. 
Uh, let me just make a, a, a brief uh, digression here about um, this uh, book by uh, uh, Catherine Beecher. I added the, this selection to the readings this year uh, because I found them fascinating, but I just noticed something a couple of days ago. The, um, the anthology that it's reproduced from uh, in, uh, in our readings, an anthology edited by, um, by Leland Roth, contains a, an introductory blurb of, by the editor, I guess. I don't know whether it was written by Roth himself, and it's uh, in the, the Xerox in the reader up at the, up the top. And I hadn't really read this editor's blurb uh, carefully before, and I just noticed that it starts out with the following statement. It says, um, the reshaping of the American house by Frank Lloyd Wright was based on the less well-known but far more radical proposals advanced a generation earlier by Catherine Beecher. And I was really kind of floored when I read this, um, this remark. I personally don't see how one can, can maintain this. It just doesn't seem plausible to me to, to suggest that all of Frank Lloyd's work was based on this, on this one book by Catherine Beecher. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright, as, uh, as we'll see, made uh, many uh, radical innovations himself, drawing from many different sources and, and ideas, not simply based on certainly on Beecher's book or any other single source. And I mention this um, partly, I guess, because I was afraid that people, that those of you who, who read this might really think that, that Frank Lloyd Wright was of, is of less significance than, uh, than some particular source in the 19th century that he may have uh, drawn from. And I um, wanted to let you know that I feel that's a mistaken notion. But also mention it to point out that you should always think critically about what you read. I'm not saying that you should necessarily reject uh, uh, an idea like this. If after studying Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, work and thinking about its uh, sources, you decide that this book by Catherine Beecher is more relevant to Frank Lloyd Wright than I happen to uh, think, that's fine. Uh, but don't accept something just because you see it in print. Or, of course, just because I happen to say it in, uh, in uh, a lecture. Uh, think about things and, uh, and come to your own conclusions. Think critically about things. That's really the, uh, I saw this as an opportunity to, um, to point that out. The next time I see Leland Roth, uh, I'm going to ask him uh, how this got printed in his anthology and if he really means it, and if so, for him to explain it to me. So I, it's, uh, I was really kind of shocked when I saw it. Or, surprised. Well, as I, um, as I mentioned, picturesque cottages were built all over the uh, United States, whether based directly on Downing's books or, or not, especially in the uh, 1850s and 60s. There are many of them in, in California and the, and the Bay Area. One sees uh, them in one form or another all, all over when, uh, when you're in areas that were, were uh, uh, built in the, um, developed in the mid-19th century. And let me just show a couple of um, examples here. Here's a house north of San Francisco in the um, town of Sonoma, the General Vallejo house. And um, it was built in 1851, apparently, which shows how um, quickly these ideas were uh, uh, being disseminated around the country at this time. Uh, Downing's books were in uh, uh, mid and late 40s, and his, uh, the, the architectural country houses 1850, and now suddenly in 1851, they're being built in, um, in California, in the wilds of California. The ideas are getting quickly from coast to coast. We see here uh, these uh, multiple gables, the, um, uh, the porches that went often wrapped around part of the, uh, the house. Have another view of another uh, side of uh, this General Vallejo house, uh, where you see the um, the pointed arch in the window, so there's a bit of Gothic revival there as well. The, uh, the bay window down here, all of these aspects which were typical of the, uh, the picturesque. And another one that, uh, uh, that I think I perhaps did not point out in uh, the slides of Downing's uh, designs, but uh, uh, they, um, they show it in, in some of his designs, which is this decorative feature which is often found up under the gable in the eaves which was uh, technically called or is called a barge board. I don't know exactly where that uh, word came from. Uh, that uh, was a, a bit of decorative uh, uh, 
ornament that was uh, put under the, um, uh, under the gable and became typical of, um, of many of these picturesque houses. And let me show one more in this area, a house in, Ho in Oakland, uh, built in the 1860s. I know the slide isn't too good. It, uh, um, you know, the color didn't come out quite right. But um, this, of course, is a somewhat more lavish house, a larger one, but it has all of these picturesque uh, characteristics, uh, lots of gables now, this multiplicity of, of gables that just increase the irregularity of the, uh, of the um, house. But despite its uh, obviously being a, 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 a built by a, um, uh, a more affluent um, a family, it's still called a cottage. And apparently it was called that by the family that built it. And it's still called the, the Moss Cottage is the name, uh, the way that, what this is called in, in Oakland. Moss was the, um, the family apparently that built it. Let me just mention one more thing about Downing. Despite his talk about uh, simple living, not all of his designs were for small houses, workers' houses. I tend, I tried to pick the ones that were more typical of that aspect of his, uh, of, of the designs in his book to um, illustrate when I was talking about Downing, but there were others that were clearly for more uh, wealthy clients. He was really providing models for, uh, uh, for everyone. Or maybe it was just that the tradition of designing for the upper classes was really too strong for him to, uh, uh, to avoid that completely. And he had to include um, more lavish houses in his books as well. So here's a, one of these, another design from arch the architecture of country houses. But I show this book also, I mean I show this design also, because it represents another variation of the picturesque a slightly different style that at the time was called Italianate. There were all, all these names for, uh, for styles uh, during this uh, period. The 19th century had, had dozens of these different styles or variations of them. But I want to mention this one. It was called the Italianate uh, partly because it's uh, relevant to architecture in San Francisco, and I'll get back to that in a minute. And, um, these designs as well were, uh, were built uh, throughout the country, though they tended to be for more upper class houses, so they weren't built in as, uh, in as large a number, but one can find them throughout the country. And one of the best examples is a house in Portland, Maine, which is this one. It's called the Morse House, uh, built uh, around 1860. The architect uh, uh, it was a man named Henry Austin, and, it, and he happens to be the same architect who designed that Egyptian revival cemetery in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. So it just points out how eclectic these uh, architects uh, were. And I think you can see when you compare these two the, uh, that, um, that they're, uh, it's, it's essentially the same style. Well, what makes it Italianate? Um, the various uh, uh, traits that uh, that were considered Italianate at, this, at the time. First of all, it's not, strictly speaking, Gothic Revival, so it couldn't be called Gothic Revival. It had more classical details of pediments, uh, as you see here, and over the windows, uh, round arches rather than, um, rather than pointed arches. So it comes from a more classical tradition. But on the other hand, the, the massing is, is picturesque. It's irregularity and often asymmetry. And especially towers were popular in the um, Italianate style. It's, um, without uh, going into the details of uh, where this style came from, I might just point out that it's partly based on a type of Italian Renaissance villa. And this is probably wh why it came to be called Italianate. And uh, a type of Italian villa, especially as represented in the uh, paintings of the 17th century French artist Claude, paintings that uh, happened to be very popular in England in the 18th and 19th centuries, and it's through there that it got to America. So you see, I, and I just mentioned this because it points out that these styles often had very co uh, convoluted and complex uh, histories and ge genealogies. Uh, it makes them interesting to, uh, uh, to study. And it's also it's one of the uh, fascinating aspects of the uh, 19th century when you really get into it in, uh, in detail. That, of course, is not the 
these details aren't particularly important for this, um, this type of course. Let's, uh, so this was the upper class version of the picturesque as it developed, at least in this Italianate uh, manner. And let's look at the interior of this Morse house, which happens to be very well preserved. This house is open to the, uh, to the public. If you're ever in the area of uh, Portland, Maine, you can go see it because it's one of the best, uh, best preserved examples in the country of how the upper classes lived in this, um, at this period in the um, 1850s and 60s. Uh, much more lavish and opulent, as you can see, than Downing would have uh, uh, approved of. This kind of uh, decor with, uh, as you can see, all of these wealthy objects and different uh, uh, elegant and expensive materials uh, piled on top of one another. It became the, um, the epitome, one might say, of the upper middle class Victorian house during this period, uh, expressive of the new wealth in America in the uh, mid-19th century in this class of, uh, in the upper class, and of the kind of um, conspicuous consumption, we might say, that was perhaps typical of the, uh, the nouveau riche. Just, of, of course, what Downing disliked. And, uh, and it's, so it's ironic that in some way he contributed to it though it's not as though it all came out of that, uh, that book of his. Uh, other people were uh, uh, promoting the uh, Italianate style as well. So it can't all be attributed to, to Downing, but to the extent that he illustrated that type of house in his, uh, in his books, so it's somewhat ironic that he had, it had something to do with the promotion of the, um, the Italianate. And it's just another one of these apparent contradictions in the 19th century. The 19th century is full of uh, contradictions, another thing that makes it interesting to study. And the uh, Italianate style was, in fact, the principal basis of what is called in San Francisco the Victorian style of architecture. This is another one of these terms that um, what we hear frequently in, in architecture, Victorian. And again, of course, if you think about it, it doesn't really tell us anything about what a building looks like. Victorian is just another one of these period terms during the period of the reign of, of Victoria. But what we think of as the San Francisco, typical San Francisco Victorian, has a lot of, uh, that, that comes from this Italianate style in combination with other, various other styles that were floating around in the 19th century. Again, it's sort of, there, there's a complex sort of genealogy behind this if we really were to analyze the typical San Francisco Victorian. But you can just see in these uh, a couple of examples that I'll be showing here that it clearly has some connection with this uh, Italianate style. Here we see one of the great uh, Victorian houses in San Francisco. It's on Fulton Street in the Western edition, uh, probably built in the, um, in the 1870s. When I was putting the lecture together today, I tried to find the, uh, the actual date of this house, but um, couldn't, uh, couldn't find it any, in any of the books I have at hand. But I think it just from looking at it, it looks about 1870s, maybe around 1880. And um, the details, as you can see, become even more imaginative. Or there's, there's a, especially in these San Francisco houses of this type, there was an exuberant kind of imagination and innovation in, in, in piling these details on top of one another. They all basically, or most of them basically, go back to these classical elements, as one finds in the, uh, the Morse house over on the left. Uh, rounded uh, arches over the windows, uh, pe pediments. You can see a little pediment over the, uh, the window here, another one uh, up here. Of uh, uh, capitals, uh, if we could see the details, uh, co columns and, and, and their capitals are sometimes pilasters. But they're all piled together in, in this amazingly uh, innovative and uh, almost whimsical kind of way that uh, takes it beyond the, uh, the original Italian aid of something like the Morse house over there. If you look like at a detail up here in this uh, uh, gable, it had, the gable has this sort of strange shape where the, uh, the roof comes down in the front and then there's an arch here, but then it's within another arch, arches within arches, and this one has this strange kind of elongated shape. So you can see that it's, it's and each one of these houses is, is different. If you go and look at them in, in San Francisco, in the old sections, like a, a, a Western edition of, um, of San Francisco, you can, it's, it's wonderful just to, to, to walk from one street to another and, uh, or, or drive by them and stop and walk around. 
And uh, they're fascinating. The more you look at them, the more uh, 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 fascinating they become, the details, to examine the details and see how each one is different and how the, uh, the, d the designers and builders of these, who in most cases were these carpenter builder types. Some of them were, were designed by professional architects, but a lot of them were just uh, uh, contractors who, however, used great imagination in uh, designing them. Here's another one, probably a little later. This probably dates from the 1880s. This is on uh, Fillmore Street, I think. And again, it's uh, picturesque, or super picturesque. It's taking it even farther with uh, all these bay windows that then change up, up here. It becomes a, a larger bay window and a smaller bay window. And underneath this uh, gable, look at these barge boards now, become very complex. It's, uh, it's this amazing uh, uh, whimsy. And in that typically American way, these uh, uh, styles uh, created by the rich to display their wealth and to come out of the, uh, that Italianate version of the picturesque quickly filtered down to other classes of, of society, that typical American pattern. And uh, so that there are uh, large numbers of um, examples of San Francisco middle class Victorian houses that have their origins clearly in the uh, Italianate and other picturesque styles. So you see these, find these rows of houses in San Francisco that are somewhat, that are more middle class houses, often uh, groups of them that are, are similar, though when you look at them you usually find some little differences from one to the, to the next that uh, have these picture, uh, bay windows and, um, and, and brackets and um, barge boards and so forth. And I will later show some even simpler uh, houses of this sort in a somewhat different context. Well, most of these San Francisco houses were built using a new type of wood construction called the balloon frame, which I'd like to turn to now, which was just one of the new developments in construction technology that occurred in the mid-19th century in America. It was a period of great technological innovation. And um, for the rest of the time today, or most of it, I'll be dealing with various of these um, technological uh, developments. The nature of the balloon frame can be uh, seen best, I think, by comparing it with the traditional system of wood construction, which we actually, which we saw earlier, uh, in connection with 17th century colonial architecture. And you may remember this uh, diagram uh, on the left here of, of a uh, 17th century New England house. Well, as you remember, in the old system, which has its roots, of course, in, uh, in European construction, medieval European construction, uh, a relatively large, uh, a relatively small number of large beams and posts were carefully joined together using those uh, various joinery techniques of uh, mortise and tenon joints and then all pegged uh, together as we see up here, uh, possibly using a few nails but very few if any since they were hard to make and expensive. Whereas the, the balloon frame that developed in the mid-19th century <coughs> has, is really basically a, a, a completely different uh, system. <clears throat> Here there's a larger number of smaller wooden members, as you can see in the diagram on the right here. Generally two by fours, boards that are two inches by four inches, that originally in the 19th century they really, it really was two inches by four inches. Today they're a good deal smaller than that. But uh, if you um, ever work with restoring or uh, 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 repairing a, uh, a 19th century building, you'll find that the two by fours are really two by four. Sometimes they're even a little bigger. In the walls, it's the two by fours would be used. Uh, and then sometimes two by sixes or two by eights for the, for the floor uh, beams and uh, the roof uh, rafters. But still sm smaller dimensions of wood than in, the, uh, than the, in the old system. And in the balloon frame, they're connected exclusively with nails. None of these fancy uh, joints and joinery techniques. And then usually this um, uh, uh, framework made of, of two by fours would be covered with sheathing. And uh, this was sometimes diagonal boards that would be um, uh, nailed over the, uh, the frame. And here in this um, 
diagram here, you can see these diagonal boards being put over the outside there as the, um, as the sheathing. Today it's um, often plywood that's used, but it's basically the same system. The balloon frame has been, has been altered and refined a bit, and it's a little different uh, today uh, in uh, wood construction, but basically the same system is still used. And the result is a structure that is made up of stable planes rather than depending on the strength of individual massive timbers, as in the uh, traditional system on the left there. And it's, so it's a, a system which structurally really works in a, in a somewhat different way. It's not just a, 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 quality, a quantitative difference of somewhat smaller members. It really structurally, it, it, it works more as planes rather than depending on individual joints at the, um, at the corners. And I think it's this quality of uh, planarity or thinness that um, perhaps was the source of the term balloon frame to describe this uh, uh, system that it just seemed uh, so light and, and, and thin that it looked uh, like a balloon that uh, might kind of, that might burst. That's a little different. There have been several explanations for where the term balloon frame came from. I think Leland Roth gives a different explanation that it came from the speed in which these buildings could be erected, though that may have been a factor as well. And the advantages of the balloon frame were, uh, were numerous. It was, um, it was faster to build. It um, was more standardized since uh, most of the pieces and the, the joints are essentially the same. And it requires fewer carpenters and also less skilled uh, carpenters. There's none of that complicated joinery that really took a lot of uh, training and experience to learn how to uh, do. It's uh, just, it's, it, it, it's, it's simpler construction. And I have a, um, the next slide is a, uh, a view, a lithographic view from the mid-19th century that uh, shows a balloon frame house under construction. It's maybe a little hard to see this uh, uh, slide, but in the back here, here's a completed house, of course, but next to it on the left, a little hard to see, is the, the house being constructed with this balloon frame system. And you can see how thin the, um, the members are, the two by fours that, of the wall. And of course, in the front there, you see the, uh, carpenters actually uh, uh, in the process of, the, of uh, construction. A somewhat idealized view, I think. They're a little too well-dressed. They look like a, a gentleman carpenters there. But it suggests the, uh, the greater ease of construction. If you, if you compare it in your mind with that view of the barn raising, uh, this required uh, 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 fewer uh, carpenters uh, and uh, not that whole uh, team of people to hoist the walls into place and so forth. It uh, was, a, um, was a much simpler process. Well, since it was so good, uh, why wasn't the balloon frame developed earlier? An interesting question. And do you have, I might just throw out that, uh, the question, do you have any ideas? Why was it uh, just in the in mid 19th century, do you think, that the balloon frame was developed? Do you have any ideas? Yes? The na nails. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's, that's clearly the, one of the main uh, reasons. Any other possibility? Well, yes? Lumber OK, lumber wheel. I think though, you've really hit, I think, the, t the two main points. It really had to do with technological advances that developed at this time in the, in the uh, mid-19th century. As you pointed out, first of all, cheap nails made possible by new ways of making nails, the wire uh, nail, as, as it was called, or came to be called, where the nails could be manufactured in large quantities versus the earlier handmade nails that really were expensive. And then uh, the second point you, you made, which was more efficient sawmill uh, production, allowing the plentiful production of um, of two by fours and two by sixes. And so it's a good example of an architectural advance that's uh, made possible by quite specific technological inventions or, or developments. And there are many other examples of this in the history of architecture. And we'll uh, see some, uh, uh, a couple more later, I think. But the balloon frame is, a, is, is one of the best examples of this kind of uh, of technological advances allowing something major to happen in the um, realm of architecture. The, um, the inventor of the balloon frame is not known for sure. Uh, there are several contenders. Uh, one, uh, 
of a man named George Washington Snow is attributed uh, to the in, uh, with the invention by um, the author uh, Siegfried Gideon, whose um, uh, uh, selection from whose book I included on the uh, reading for this week about the balloon frame. But other people have been advanced, and I think probably it was developed simultaneously by different people. It was one of these ideas whose time was 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 right for these technological reasons that would have been invented by someone else if it hadn't been uh, by Snow. Probably happened around uh, 1830. And um, one of the first balloon frame buildings, apparently, that has been documented was a small Catholic church in Chicago built in uh, the mid-1830s. Uh, but I show this partly just because there's no way of telling from the exterior that it's a balloon frame. So you don't really know unless you got in and looked at the, and were able to examine the, uh, the structure. And I'll come back to this uh, point in a minute. The, um, the new method spread rapidly throughout the country, especially the, uh, in the Midwest and the West. Carpentry uh, manuals uh, explaining it were published. And in uh, the mid-1850s, a writer in the um, New York Tribune could say the following. If it had not been for the knowledge of the balloon frame, Chicago and San Francisco could never have arisen as they did from little villages to great cities in a single year. Uh, not too great an exaggeration. Didn't happen in a single year, but that's not too far off. The, um, the appearance of the balloon frame suggests an interesting question, I think, when we recall what was happening stylistically in architecture during this period, the 1830s and 40s, just what we've been talking about with uh, the Gothic Revival and especially the picturesque. Uh, so here again, I show you a, a picturesque house, this, this moss cottage in, uh, in Oakland, because in some ways, these new styles seem to be especially appropriate to the balloon frame system, if you think about it. Earlier American building styles, up to and including the Greek Revival, were typified, of course, by, by simple four-square structures. Uh, if you recall the, the buildings that we've seen earlier, they all tend to be simple shapes, usually with a, a rectangle or a square. That were more appropriate, if you think about it, to the old system of wood construction. When you're building out of those great big heavy uh, timber beams that are very hard to connect, it's hard, for example, to, to construct a corner in that old uh, uh, system because every time you come to a corner, you have to put uh, at least three of those large timbers uh, together, and they have to be uh, all joined with this complex joinery and pegged, and it, and it just takes a long time whenever you build a, uh, uh, the corner or any kind of irregularity. So. Uh, so you really try to stick to, a, to a, a simple rectangle just to make the construction more, um, more ease, uh, make it easier. But, the, but this picturesque style with the complex plans and these irregularities and porches and different gables and all of that seem in some ways more suited to the balloon frame. Uh, these, the corners are easier to build, for example, and it just makes it it's, it's easier. They seem to go, go together. And it suggests the question, did the invention of the balloon frame influence these stylistic developments that we've been looking at in American architecture of the, of the period? Well, this is a, a question that's been examined a bit by architectural historians, especially by um, uh, Vincent Scully in part of a book that he wrote many years ago on, uh, on this period. And it would be nice if we could come to a conclusion one way or another. It would be especially nice, I think, if one could prove or demonstrate that the balloon frame really did inspire somehow the development of these new styles. Unfortunately, there's, it's, it's, there's no clear answer. It's ambiguous. But it's interesting, I think, just to raise the question, this, and because it raises the, it, it's part of the larger question of the relationship between structural and formal develops in architecture. And it reminds us that these are not necessarily completely separate things. One uh, sometimes tends to read about the history of architecture and read about styles and how they change as if that's something that you can just study alone. And then separately maybe read about technological changes and that's a, a, a different subject. Maybe that's engineering rather than architecture. But in fact, it doesn't really work that way. Often there are very close relationships and complex interactions between 
uh, structural developments and stylistic developments. And here's a point in history where that question is certainly relevant and can be asked even if uh, we uh, have not been able to, uh, to answer the question clearly. Well, related to um, the balloon frame, or uh, similar, or parallel to it, there was another technological uh, development in the mid-19th century that um, affected the construction of houses, which was new types of woodworking tools, such as um, the band saw that um, we see here that I found this engraving of. So, and some of these uh, new tools were driven by steam power. That's another uh, well, a technological uh, development that's happening during this time in the 19th century and that also in various ways has relevance to uh, architecture. So you can see how all of these new technological things are happening. But uh, these, these tools in particular, woodworking tools, allowed much quicker and cheaper fabrication of intricate wooden members, including architectural ornament, such as those decorated uh, brackets and barge boards that um, we uh, find in so much of the uh, picturesque architecture that we've uh, been seeing, as in the, um, as you see a bit of in the, the Moss House over on the left there. Uh, as a result, decoration, which previously could only have been uh, used in houses for the wealthy because it would have to be carved by hand, now was much more available to the middle classes as uh, well because it could be done, made almost uh, in a, a mass-produced kind of way or much more easily. And there was a proliferation of this kind of machinery with the invention of all sorts of ingenious uh, devices, some of which allowed the mass production of architectural details and ornaments. And here on the left, it's a little hard to see maybe, but we have a, a view of the vast woodworking machinery exhibition at the 1876 World's Fair in, in Philadelphia, one of the, of the first major World's Fair, I, th uh, I think we could say, in America that occurred in Philadelphia in 1876, the centennial of the American Revolution. It was called the Centennial Fair. And um, it's interesting and of, of uh, revealing, I think, that a large section of the, uh, of the fair, this uh, uh, large hall, was filled with this um, uh, uh, newly invented machinery, much of which was used for, um, uh, for woodworking and had architectural purposes. So it shows how much people were interested in these uh, developments in the um, mid and late 19th century. So this facilitated that uh, American tendency for styles that begin with the upper classes to uh, filter down to all uh, classes of construction. And it really did happen that way, that suddenly this, uh, this ornament and decoration uh, now starts appearing on all sorts of uh, houses, including, let me show an example from San Francisco. Here are typical workers' houses in San Francisco that would have been very cheap when they were built in the, uh, probably in the 1880s, these very small, uh, cheap houses, yet they have some of that decoration on them which probably for the uh, people who um, bought them or built them and lived in them was no doubt a, uh, a mark of prestige or pride that connected them or uh, allowed them to identify with these various styles that previously would have been thought of as just as upper class styles. So we might th think of this as a kind of uh, democratization of ornament uh, perhaps and certainly of this, um, these uh, stylistic uh, developments. Well, next I'd like to look uh, just briefly at a, another type of American inventiveness in um, wood construction at about this time, which is experiments in, in designing trusses, especially for bridges. You can see that I'm uh, trying to touch on lots of uh, things today, and I hope it doesn't, uh, that I'm not moving too fast on all this. All of these things would be interesting to look at in, in more detail. And, uh, I uh, just, uh, in order to, uh, I couldn't really cut any of them out. I think they're all interesting, and so I'm having to move through them kind of quickly. Well, um, a, a truss, as I think I, I may have mentioned uh, once before, is uh, uh, simply a spanning member, but that's made up of smaller parts. In other words, not a solid uh, beam, uh, but something that uh, is, is uh, built up of, of, of smaller parts that can be wood or metal or various materials. Uh, and then can span as a, uh, in a bridge uh, like this, like these designs for bridges. 
And various different patterns of trusses <laughs> were um, experimented with and developed and even patented in the, uh, in the 19th century. On the left, we see one of these that was called the lattice truss. They usually were given different names, sometimes the names of their uh, inventors. This one was invented by, um, by our friend Ithiel Town, the architect who uh, was the partner of, um, of Davis, the firm of Town and Davis. And it shows that a lot of these architects were very interested in engineering as well and were uh, made engineering um, improvements from one sort or another. And in this case, he patented this uh, lattice truss in um, the 1820s and was widely used for bridges and actually made a lot of money for, uh, for him. Maybe he uh, uh, paid for that uh, painting by Thomas Cole, The Architect's Dream, with his money from the lattice truss. Um, and on the right, we see other truss designs of this uh, period, some of them employing iron rods along with the wooden uh, uh, members. And so it's another example of iron being increasingly used uh, during this period. We'll see more of that in a minute. Each of uh, these different designs where the, uh, the pattern of the truss was a little different, whether it's uh, in, uh, forming this lattice <coughs> shape or uh, forming squares with uh, diagonal members, and there were, there were different uh, variations on this. And each one, each variation had its own structural characteristics. People began to realize this in the 19th century. Uh, engineering analysis became um, uh, much more sophisticated during this period. They found that each one of these uh, patterns had certain advantages. Uh, depending on the type of bridge that was needed, the weight it had to support, the uh, building materials that were available, and, and so forth. And in the mid and late 19th century, many bridges were built using these uh, designs. Of uh, Part of the uh, development of the infrastructure in the uh, American environment in the uh, 19th century, many more br roads being built. They had to build uh, bridges, of course. And um, some of these um, early truss bridges Wood truss bridges still survive in New England and in uh, some other parts of the country. Uh, let's look at a couple of these. Some are known only from old photographs, uh, like this one. Here's one in uh, New Hampshire that is built, indeed, with this uh, lattice truss uh, uh, pro devised by uh, Ithiel Town. And, um, but you can see uh, through the bridge, I think, just in silhouette here, that there's another form uh, helping to hold up the bridge, which is a um, an arch, but made out of, uh, out of wood, a kind of early laminated wood arch. And I think um, I have another view of this, of a similar arch on a, another bridge on the, on the right there. Both of these are uh, from New, New Hampshire. And you notice, of course, that in both these cases, the bridges were, were covered. And uh, the, the, the reason uh, uh, these covered bridges were built was simply to protect their structure from the elements. The actual, the, the, the structure, these trusses that held up the bridge were difficult to uh, construct and they, they wanted to do anything they could to uh, protect them and keep them from being, uh, from rotting and so forth. So that was the point of covering these bridges. Ithiel Town, in one of his patents, claimed that a covered bridge would last seven or eight times as long as an uncovered uh, bridge. I'm not sure just what uh, information that was based on, but that's really, that was the motive for doing this. And um, this uh, arch, if we could see this better, you could see that the, that the arch is made up of pieces of strips of wood that are then bolted together. It's kind of an early form of the laminated wood arch that um, is a, a, so another technological architectural de development that was being innovated with in the 19th century. There's this, this, this great uh, fertility of uh, inventive imagination in engineering and building construction in America in the 19th century. A um, more dramatic development in bridge technology in the mid-19th century are suspension bridges using uh, iron cables. So I'd like to look at that briefly. And again, I uh, feel bad that I can't uh, go into more detail about all of these subjects because they're all so fascinating. One of the problems about trying to give a uh, survey course on all of American architecture in, uh, in one quarter. It's, uh, it's actually sometimes almost physically painful to me. I want to be including more slides and talking more about these things than I have time for. But the whole the subject of suspension bridges uh, using iron and then later steel cables is, um, is a fascinating story. They, uh, they were based on earlier suspension bridges in England. Again, it's another one of these uh, developments which 
was not really invented in America of iron sus uh, and suspension bridges. It was a, a technology that uh, was pioneered in mainly in England, to some extent France, in the starting in the 18th century, in the late 18th century. But in the mid 19th century, it was America really that took this form of the suspension bridge and applied it on a much larger scale than it had been uh, used in England or, um, or elsewhere in Europe. And uh, one of the main figures in this um, kind of quantum leap in the uh, practice of suspension bridges in America uh, was a, um, a great engineer named John Roebling, who spent his whole career really uh, uh, refining and developing the suspension bridge uh, technology. It, uh, uh, was com there were lots of complex problems that had to be resolved with just how the, the cables would be made and how they'd be supported. At first, in England, the, the uh, cables had actually been chains where they, they were large uh, chains, but then it was found that if, they, if you used uh, wire cables that were uh, uh, woven together in certain ways, uh, that it actually would be much stronger than, uh, than chains. And all of this technology was uh, uh, developed and refined by people like John Roebling in America. And on the left, we see his first really major uh, suspension bridge, which was in Cincinnati, Ohio, built in the 1850s and still exists. But on the right is uh, Roebling's greatest bridge, the uh, Brooklyn Bridge, going from Manhattan to uh, over the East River to, uh, to Brooklyn. And we see it here under construction. It was begun in 1867 and took many years. It wasn't completed until 1883. It was a tremendously uh, complex uh, uh, construction. Pride, pr probably, I, I've, I've never really thought about this, but it probably was the most ambitious uh, construction project maybe in, in America up to that time because not only it did not only involve the suspension cables and the actual parts that we see, but of course, a bridge like this had to have great foundations under the, uh, the water that were very uh, difficult to, uh, to build and dangerous as well. Often many w workers died with in the, uh, the caissons that had to be uh, lowered down into the, um, uh, the uh, for the excavation for the foundations and an extremely uh, complex uh, job. It, when it was built, it was the greatest bridge in the world at, the, at that time, the span. The 1,600 uh, feet, that is the span in between the two, uh, the two piers, the main suspension cables. And it remained the longest bridge in the longest suspension bridge uh, in the world until well into the 20th century. At the um, time it was built, it was considered so phenomenal that its um, construction was documented in, in detail. And as a result, we have uh, of innumerable of uh, uh, lithographic uh, views, engravings, and, and photographs of the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. All of the details and every aspect of it were uh, uh, documented and, and published in newspapers and magazines. It was uh, uh, really a, a great, it was uh, important news that was followed by the, uh, by the entire country with descriptions and, uh, and uh, engravings in the popular press and um, produced a kind of national pride uh, over the fact that America was creating the greatest bridge in the world. And we might say that it was the, the first time, perhaps, that uh, America now is producing unprecedented architecture. All of the early th earlier things we've seen, of course, from the colonial period, uh, they, um, for the most part, came uh, from um, ideas from Europe, and then they were transformed in interesting ways in America. But nothing that you could say was absolutely um, uh, phenomenally new, and uh, or that, and, and now suddenly America begins to be put on the map internationally, and it's interesting that it's mainly for these engineering uh, uh, feats. Finally, a view of the completed. Oops, I thought I had a view of the. Yeah, here we go. The um, completed Brooklyn Bridge, which probably sums up better than anything else the new industrial and urban character of America in the uh, mid-19th century. So different from the earlier agrarian and rural nature of, of the country. Before we leave the Brooklyn Bridge, I just might uh, point out that if you look at the piers, which of course are made of, of, of stone, 
The, um, uh, the form of the piers, maybe you can see it best on the right here, is actually a pointed arch. So it suggests, at least, uh, the, the Gothic revival. There's nothing el other else that really is specifically Gothic there, but just the fact that those ar arches are pointed is a hint of the Gothic uh, revival. So there's a little hint of eclecticism here. The 19th century just couldn't avoid it, I guess. Uh, but for the most part, the forms are based quite directly on the engineering of factors and the, the functions that needed to be satisfied for each part of, of the bridge. As a result, I think if we think back to Horatio Greeno and his uh, remarks about um, American architecture, he surely would have approved of the, um, of the Golden Gate Bridge. It uh, satisfies those principles that he laid down in such a um, prescient, uh, uh, forward-looking manner. Greeno, unfortunately, was not around to appreciate the Golden Gate, the, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, because he uh, died in the, um, he had died in the 1850s. I said Golden Gate Bridge by mistake, it was somehow on my mind. And of course, the Golden Gate Bridge uh, is, uh, is perhaps the, it, at least I think it's the greatest suspension bridge of the 20th century. Not, it's now not the longest, but I think it's the most beautiful and the most uh, uh, perfect in, in, in many ways in its engineering and, and how the form follows the function. So um, it's, it's clearly in this, in this tradition of uh, drawing on this tradition of the, um, of the Brooklyn Bridge, but just refining the engineering further. Another development in iron technology in the mid-19th century was the use of cast iron in buildings. And this, too, I want to say something about just briefly. Now, iron previously had been used for isolated parts of buildings, but in the 1840s, in New York, a number of people, and especially a man named James Bogardus, got the idea of making buildings totally out of iron. And I think, again, maybe this was an American idea. Iron had been used, certainly, in, in Europe, in England, and in, in, in France, uh, starting in the 18th century, <clears throat> but usually just for parts of buildings. And uh, the, uh, Americans, again, this kind of um, technological imagination or taking ideas to their uh, logical conclusion. This guy, Bogardus, decided that why not, why can't we have buildings that are totally made out of iron? And he designed a number of commercial and industrial buildings. And here on the right is uh, one of these. The, um, uh, this is the Harper and Brothers building in uh, New York City from the um, 1840s. And on the left, I have a detail of another building that still survives called the uh, Lang Stores in which um, almost all of the parts were made of uh, iron, all of the structural parts anyway. Cast iron columns, uh, beams, here, here we see on the, in the Lang stores the, uh, the columns, the, the beams, this would be a, um, a separate member here, they would be bolted together and then a what was called a spandrel beam would be set in here. Uh, the, uh, that would partly help stiffen the, the, the structure and also because they uh, didn't want to have the window come down to the floor. Uh, and then all of this, so there are just three basic elements here, the columns and the beams and the, and the spandrel, as it was called. They were all kind of standardized uh, and bolted together. So you can see it's a, really a type of prefabrication. Bogardus had uh, grandiose plans for this a scheme of uh, his of, of having buildings all built out of iron. He wanted all kinds of uh, uh, buildings to be built this way, even domestic houses. It never happened. His ideas were never really put fully into, into effect. But he did designs such as the following to publicize his ideas, very imaginative designs. This was a project that he uh, proposed for a uh, gigantic building for another one of these uh, World's Fairs in, in uh, 1853. Actually, it was an earlier one. I mentioned the World's Fair of 1876. There had been some earlier ones, smaller ones, in America. And uh, there was a New York World's Fair in 1853. And Bogardus proposed this immense building for the uh, fair that would, would have a, a huge tower, probably taller than any um, of, of a tower in modern times uh, previously. It went up even higher than we see here. And then uh, cables were to be strung across here, like a uh, as in suspension bridge, and they would support the, um, uh, the roof. A very early um, example of this kind of suspension structure that buildings like this have been built in 
but just recently in the, in the 20th century. Um, it was never built. Of course, it would have seemed uh, crazy to people at the time. But it represents this daring aspect of the visions of, of these 19th century engineers. Mainly, iron was used for commercial and industrial buildings. And one of the best preserved of the early ones of this is a building in, um, in New York called the Howitt Building. Uh, it's spelled H-A-U-G-H-W-O-U-T. Uh, and I never really know how to pronounce that. Uh, uh, but I th think maybe it's called the Howard Building. Built in uh, 1857 in, in New York. And I have a detail of it over on the left. It just happens to be one of these that's been preserved, and in fact, very well preserved. So we can see the details. Also, you can see that, that now they're beginning to realize that, um, that uh, if you're casting parts of a building in iron, you can really cast them in any shape. You can cast them with detail on them. And they, so they be start becoming more complex. If you look at the, it's a little hard to see maybe, but if you look at these columns, they have Corinthian capitals. And it, uh, they're using all of these revivalistic elements in the casting of iron. It can be done easily. Ornament can be cast easily in, uh, in iron. And in some ways, it, um, uh, it was just it was too appealing not to do, but it um, uh, is considered by people who, uh, from an engineering point of view, to, um, to have been an unfortunate development. And again, Horatio Greeno probably would have disliked it. He would have wanted a more honest expression of the iron rather than making it look like Renaissance uh, 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 forms uh, in stone. So there was a kind of um, uh, element of dishonesty that began to, uh, to, to creep in here. But if we look at the overall form of the, this Howard building, we see that there are five stories which was about the limit that this iron system could support. But it's the beginning of the development of the skyscraper, of course, which we'll be seeing later, when uh, steel uh, made the, uh, created the possibility of much uh, taller structures, since steel is uh, a stronger version of iron. And it's also significant that this Howitt building just happens to contain the first practical public elevator which was invented by a man named um, uh, Otis, another prerequisite of the skyscraper. And as with the, the balloon frame, we see here that new developments in technology, including iron, but also the, ele the elevator, make possible the creation of new architectural forms, in this case, the skyscraper that we'll be seeing. So another aspect of that, what we were um, talking about before. Yes. It, yeah, it looks it uh, right. It looks like it's uh, maybe just uh, part of it's maybe vacant down at the bottom there. This is um, an old photograph. It's a slide I took many years ago, uh, and so I and I don't and I haven't uh, looked it up recently in recent years, and so I don't know. But I suspect that it probably is better preserved than this now, because there's been a lot of interest just in recent years in in uh, in the field of architectural preservation not only in buildings that would have, been would have been considered great architecture in the past, something like Lyndhurst, but engineering buildings and commercial buildings like, like this. So there's a lot more interest in this aspect of American architectural history now. And so I suspect it probably is, uh, has been fixed up and is maybe even open to the public now. If any of you happen to know of, 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 about this building from New York, let, let me know. It's in the Soho section of uh, downtown um, uh, Manhattan. The, um, finally, in the time that remains today, I'd like to uh, look at another and actually rather peculiar innovation in mid-19th century America. And that's at least partly technological. And it's um, a phenomenon uh, called the octagon house. That was, uh, pr it's an amazing story that um, is um, interesting in a number of ways. It was, this is a, um, an innovation or invention that was promoted single-handedly by a man named Orson Squire Fowler. He was um, one of these typical uh, 19th century American inventors, but also an eccentric, uh, a figure fascinated with, with progress and with uh, new ideas of all sorts. 
He um, was also an advocate of, um, besides the Octagon House that we'll be looking at, his, his other big passion or interest, even more, he was even more involved in this, was uh, the field of phrenology, which uh, you may know uh, was a, a, a fad in the, in the 19th century a, uh, uh, based on a theory that uh, one's personality was determined and could be read from the bumps on one's head. And um, Orson Squire Fowler was the big advocate of phren phrenology. So he was uh, something of a flake, but, or a, uh, certainly an eccentric. But he also became very interested in architecture, though he had no professional background or training in it. And in the 1840s, he became obsessed with two, uh, two ideas about architecture. The first one was, uh, had to do with the material concrete. Now, we haven't really seen anything about uh, uh, concrete. It really wasn't used in American architecture. It began to be uh, experimented with in the 19th century. But he came to the idea uh, that concrete was the best building material. And uh, he thought it would be uh, cheaper to use and easier, to, uh, uh, easier for, for building uh, houses. Uh, it never quite worked out that way, at least in, 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 um, in his time. But his second idea had much more effect on building in America. And that was that the octagon was the best shape for buildings, and especially for domestic houses. And in 1849, he published a book called A Home for All, one of these um, kind of popular, uh, somewhat amateur books on architecture, of which there were so many as uh, in, the, in the 19th century. We've seen a couple of others with Downing and so forth, but there were, just, there were loads of them. It was just, uh, there were lots of ideas out there about, about architecture. But his was just particularly uh, uh, strange. And he advocated building all houses in the shape of an octagon. He also said they should be made of, uh, of concrete, but that idea wasn't uh, picked up quite so much. On the right, we see um, uh, the plan of his own, or on the left, is his own house in uh, New York that he built and no longer survives. And I can't remember whether the plan on the right is, is of that house or if it's another one that he published. He published a lot of different plans for the houses. The main reason, well, why did he like the octagon? The main reason that he advanced for it was that an octagon encloses a greater area for a given perimeter than a square plan. And thus, he said it was a more efficient use of material. Well, and he admitted that, that actually a circle would be the best form, the best plan, uh, if that was your main criterion for building. It would be the most efficient of all. But he said that uh, circles were hard to build, and thus the octagon was the best kind of compromise. But one disadvantage that uh, w seemed to have been ignored by Fowler is that it's very hard to lay out rooms in an octagon, at least all sorts of odd-shaped rooms, wasted space, uh, and so forth. And um, as a result, it's really kind of questionable whether that one criterion of the, 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 the optimal relationship between surface area and, and space is, it should really be the main consideration in determining the form of a house. I think there's a fundamental kind of flaw in his thinking. But he proposed this and, it, and, he, and created a lot of interest in octagon houses through his book. Oh, here I've turned this plan on, on its side by mistake, but it doesn't matter, this uh, uh, slide. Because uh, here is a whole uh, group of different plans that were advocated either by Fowler or other people or were tried out for how to arrange rooms inside octagon houses, and including some like this. You can see where they're pie-shaped uh, rooms. And it shows that people really didn't know that it really didn't work out very well. It was hard to figure out just how best to, to have a house in a plan of an octagon. But despite this problem, he converted a lot of people to his, uh, this cult, we might say, of the octagon house. And in the 1850s, octagon houses were built all over the United States. It, it, it's another example, I think, of the, um, of the willingness, or it shows the willingness of Americans at this time to experiment. And I think it really is, is, is an American uh, characteristic. Europeans would never have been, um, would have had this willingness to, uh, to try new ideas, a much more conservative uh, kind of strain in, 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 in European architecture. But there's the, the 19th century Americans loved new ideas. And they were very willing to, if they read Fowler's book, to, um, to just go ahead and, and build a, a house out of uh, shaped as an octagon. And there are examples all over. Let's uh, look at some of these. 
or a couple of them. Here's a house in Wisconsin made of, of brick. Most of them were not built of concrete, though a, a few were. Most of them are either brick or um, stone or wood. Here's uh, one in San Francisco. I think this is on Union Street, if I remember correctly. There were se several actually built in, in San Francisco in the 19th century, but only two of them survive. And finally, I want to uh, show what is no doubt the oddest octagon house of all that was built in America, which is in Natchez, Mississippi, a house called Longwood, built uh, by an, uh, the architect was a man named Samuel Sloan, but it was built for uh, a man named Dr. Nutt, uh, <laughs> uh, and built in 1861. And it's. Uh, got to be my favorite of all of these octagon houses. And it, so it shows, it combines the octagon fad of uh, Orson Squire Fowler's with several revival styles, as you can see. It would be hard to even figure out what they all are. A kind of Turkish revival with this uh, dome, maybe little bits of, uh, of Italianate and perhaps even a little Gothic. There's a little bit of everything in here. So that ec uh, eclecticism, the eccentric uh, strain in American architecture, it maybe sums up in some ways all of these things happening in the 19th century, these peculiarly American characteristics. Well, next time we will uh, look at the career of, uh, of Frederick Law Olmsted. And um, I, uh, since uh, we have a few minutes left, I will hang around for any questions you might want to uh, ask. Just come down to the front of the room if you want to um, have a discussion.